chapter 1. John chapter 1, don't look at your watches. I know it's 20 minutes to 12, so don't worry. All right? There's a caboose, and I can, chapter 1, begin at verse 1. In the beginning was the Word. Now, there's two Greek words actually for the word Word. The first one is Logos, actually representing Jesus Christ. He is the, the living Word. Then there is Rima, R H E M A, meaning that which is spoken. Jesus not only was the living presentation of God's Word, He literally spoke the Word of God to you and me. But what did He speak? Well, He spoke and represented Himself as the God-man. Coming into this world, not only as God, 100% God, but also 100% man. For you see, if He had just been 100% God, and not 100% man, he could have never died upon the cross for our sins. He had to become flesh. And of course, John expresses that they didn't listen to God. They disobeyed God. Therefore, they brought upon themselves and upon the whole human race death, eternal separation from God. But God intended eternal life. And so, through the person of Christ, he once again presented the greatest gift, the greatest thing anyone could ever have, and that is eternal life. Quote with me John 3, 16. I know you the verse. I know you know the verse, but let's quote it together. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. That was God's intent for every person. Look back at verse number 2 of John, the book of John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. God wanted to make it very clear who was coming to this earth. Not just an ordinary man, but God instilled in a physical body. He thought it not robbing of equal with God, but took on him the form of a servant and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, Paul said in Philippians chapter 2. God intended, folks, for you and I not to have any question concerning who this person was called Jesus. He was to be the Savior of the world. God come down to this earth to understand us, to give to us eternal life. You see, God wanted us to understand that. So he sent the Word, not only to represent the Godhead, but to speak for the Godhead. You see, back years ago, and I'm an old country boy, I'm from Kentucky. How many Kentuckians we got here? Raise your hand. Boy, I'm in good company, because the rest of you folks, you're going to have a battle on your hand. See, it doesn't take that many to wipe out a lot of Northerners. All right. But in the old days, when a person gave the word, it was like a bond. Now, I'm not talking about bonding something. I'm talking about a bond, a payment, a guarantee that it was going to be fulfilled. God's Son, Jesus Christ, was His guarantee that He was going to provide something of the greatest gift that you could ever have, and that's eternal life. Recently, Mike Evans of the Jerusalem prayer team uh, sent this, uh, and I get a daily letter from him, and maybe some of you do also. He said, we all know of the gifts the wise men brought to Jesus, but those gifts aren't what most people think they were. And until I read this, it really, I had never thought of it before. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh were not gifts for a baby. They were the burial items of a king. Jesus was God's representative of the king of kings and lord of lords that's going to rule and reign one of these days. I'm wondering, is he ruling and reigning in your heart? You see, you can be a Christian, but still not letting Christ rule and reign in your life. God wants that in your life. God wants us to understand this. 
And Isaiah 9, 6, it's for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counsel, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. In John 8, 37, Pilate, Therefore said unto him, Art thou a king? Then Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. You see, Jesus came as a representative of the Godhead to give us all these things that were intended for us. The Holy Spirit brought something else into my mind as I thought about that. The Bible says this in John 3, 17. For God sent not his Son in the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be what, folks? Might be saved. His desire is for everyone to be saved. As the Bible says, he was manifested to do that. But something else God wanted us to understand about his son Jesus, so we're not confused with all of the different types of religion and everything that goes on in the world. Look back at your Bible there and look at verse number 3. He intended it for us to understand who made us, who made this world. All things were made by who? Him. That's in reference to the Word. And without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. So God intended for us to understand his representative that he sent in his own son, Jesus Christ. There's a second thing very quickly. Would you look down at verse 11 through 13? God's intent was to visit us to provide deliverance. In other words, we would call it salvation. He says, he came unto his own, and his own did what? Received him not. But here is the key. But as many as received him. You see, it's not just an intellect. An intellectual thought. Yeah, I, I, I want God. No. He says you must receive him. For as many as received him, to them gave he what? power to become the sons of God to them that believe on his name. Hebrews 10, 5 through 7 says, Therefore when he came to the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me, and burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you had no pleasure. And then notice what he says. Then he said, Lo, I come in the volume of the book, as it is written of me, to do your will Oh, God. That was his intent. To do the will of the Father. That's what Christmas is all about, is knowing and doing the will of the Father. Letting people know the salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. But wait a minute. Look down to verse 14 for a third thing very quickly. God's intent was to express his glory. Now, many of the pictures we see of Christ there in the manger scene, we see this round-shaped thing. Uh, we call it the Shekinah glory. Jesus was to represent the Father in showing his glory. That's why the Bible tells us that we ought to glorify the Father and everything. Jesus came to glorify the Father, to let people know about the Father. One day in John chapter 14, the people that stood there with him, they asked him, show us the Father. And he says, have I been so long with you and you have not known me? He that has seen me, say it with me, has seen the Father. The Shekinah glory, the goodness of God. God's intent was to bring a time of peace to our hearts. Look down there if you would. In your Bible it says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten, the Father, full of grace and truth. And then over in Luke chapter 2, and I'll turn over there because of time, but Luke chapter 2 and verse 14 has a very interesting statement as well. It says, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. That was God's intent to bring you and I peace. 
And Paul one day, the Holy Spirit tapped him on the shoulder there in Romans chapter 5 and verse 1. He says, therefore being justified by faith, say it with me, we have peace with God. How? Through our Lord Jesus Christ. God's intent for Jesus was for him to be a peacemaker between God and man because the Bible tells us that we were in enmity between us and God. We were in a battle. We were in a war between us and God because of our sin. But God's intent was to bring peace into our heart. God's intent was to express his grace and his truth. You see, folks, grace is God's unmerited showed towards mankind in that he permitted Jesus to come to this earth. Most of you here this morning can quote Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 if you can. Quote it with me. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. God's intent was to give you a gift of grace so you and I could be saved not by our own works of righteousness, which could never bring us salvation. God's intent, of course, was to, to take and to have a personal contact with you and me. I mean, after all, you see, no man ever saw God in his true essence and lived, the Bible tells us in the Old Testament. That's the reason God had to hide Moses in the cleft of the rock, because of the very presence of God would be destructive. So God says, I've got to do something so I do not destroy my creation, my prime creation of mankind. And so I'll come in the form of a baby. And he'll grow up. And at the age of 33, he'll pay the price for man's sin. So God's desire and God's intent was a personal contact with each of us. He was manifested. Now the question is, why was he manifested? Would you turn back to 1 John chapter 1 once again very quickly? 1 John chapter 1. And look down at verses 3 and 4 of that same book that we read from just a while ago. And we read that second verse. So look at verse 3. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. You see, through the person of Christ, Adam and Eve, they walked and they talked there in the garden. They had fellowship with him. But because of the sin, that fellowship was broken. And God desired, his intent was, that that fellowship be restored. And he would do it through his son, Jesus Christ. Why? Look down to verse 4. Now, I don't want to get into my message of this evening but look at verse 4. He said, And these things, what things? The previous three verses. Were written unto you that you may, that your joy may be what? Full. See, there's no fullness of joy without the intent of God being carried out in your life and my life. You see, God wants us to understand. He loves all of us. Not too long ago, I was taking one of my seminary courses. And I had a friend that I communicated with that was also in the class, and he lived in Jerusalem. His name was Scott Mills. And Scott was telling me to, uh, he would really appreciate it if I would pray for him. And uh, we corresponded back, and he says, I, every day I run, I go out and run, and I run by the Bedouins. And I want to have a witness to them. I want to tell them about this person called Jesus Christ and how they can be saved. And I came to find out, Doc, the better ones are shepherds. And they're not shepherds like we think of them. They were the downtrod people. They were the filthy people, so to speak, of that day of society. And Jesus came face to face with them, and they were the first ones to come to his manger scene because he wants to tell us something. Doesn't matter how bad you are off, doesn't matter how far down you've gone, God still loves you. Doesn't matter who you are, God loves you. 
and want you to be saved. God's desire in personal contact with us was to do that. Let me give you one last thing very quickly. God's intent was to show us the miracle of His power. The miracle of His power. Look back at verse 12 again there in John chapter 1. But as many as received Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God. You see, He's the only one that has the power to change you and me. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a what? New creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. I was reading a story this past week of a little girl. She went into a bedroom and pulled out a glass jelly jar from the hiding place where she was saving money. And she poured the change out on the floor and counted it carefully. Matter of fact, so carefully she did it three times because it had to be exact. And she took and left after counting that money and went six blocks away to the Rexall drugstore. And she waited patiently for the pharmacist to give her some attention. But you see, he was too busy talking to his brother who he hadn't seen in a long time. The little girl by the name of Tess twisted her feet and tried to make a noise to get the pharmacist's attention, but he didn't give it to her. Finally, she took one of the pieces of money, a quarter of it, and tapped it on the counter to get his attention, and he, she got his attention because money speaks. He says, and what do you want, young lady? Being kind of annoyed in his tone of voice. She said, I'm talking, I'm talking to my brother. He says, I'm talking to my brother from Chicago. Can't you just be not disruptive and let me talk to him? Again, she spoke up and said, well, I know I'm annoying, but I'm here. wanting to get a miracle for my brother. What do you mean? Well, his name is Andrew, and he has something bad that's growing inside of his head, and my daddy says only a miracle can save him now. And so much of a miracle does he need that I've come here with the money that I have. And the pharmacist looked at the little girl and said, we don't sell miracles here, little girl. I'm sorry, I can't help you. But you don't understand, sir. I have the money to pay for it. The pharmacist's brother, who was there nearby, looked at the little girl and stooped down to her and says, what kind of a miracle does your brother need? And she looked up at him and says, I don't know. But I have the money to pay for it. How much do you have? Asked the man from Chicago. I have one dollar and eleven cents. And it's all the money I have, but I can get more if, if you need it. A man from Chicago, the bro pharmacist's brother, looked at the little girl and says, Well, what a coincidence. A dollar and eleven cents, the exact price of a miracle for a little brother. And so he took her by the hand and he says, I want you to take me to your, to your, your, your brother and, and your parents. That well-dressed man was Dr. Carlton Armstrong, a surgeon specializing in neosurgery. Her operation was completed free of charge, and it wasn't long before little Andrew was home again. Mom and Dad were happily taken about the chain of events that took place in the surgery that was able to cure their son. Her mom and dad whispered, to one another and says, really, how much did that miracle cost? And the little girl said, a dollar and 11 cents in the faith of a little child. You see, God wants to do miracles in your life and my life. God has the intent if we will let him. But we think we have to have a lot of money. We have to have a lot of personality. We have to have a lot of abilities before God will give us uh, his attention. But God's intention is to save whosoever will. God's intention is to help you whatever your need might be in your life. 
I want to close with this story because it's kind of close to me. My sister-in-law is from the Philippines. She doesn't live in Manila. But I read this story this past week and it really touched my heart and I hope it touches yours. The author and pastor Leith Anderson told about his visiting Manila, the capital there, the Philippines, and was taken of all places there in Manila but to the garbage place that many people live, to the dump. Tens of thousands of people make their homes on that dump site. They've constructed shacks out of things other people have thrown away. And they send their children out early every morning to scavenge for food out of other people's garbage so they can have a family meal. People who have been born and grown up there on the garbage month, they have had their families, their children, their shacks, their garbage to eat, finished out their lives, and there they have died, not even going into the city of Manila. It's an astonishing thing to see. But also, there are some American missionaries who have made their home there on the dump in Manila. They have chosen to leave their own country and communicate the love of Jesus Christ to people who otherwise would never hear the saving grace of God through Jesus Christ. That is an amazing thing to me that people would take and go and live on a dump to try to reach other people. And then I thought, wait a minute. A greater thing took place over 2,000 years ago when Jesus Christ left heaven's portals of glory and came down to this dumpy earth to die upon that cross for you and me. Amen. And that was God's intent. He was born to die. That's why he was wrapped in swaddling clothes, because swaddling clothes is the clothing of a dead person. And he did it all for you and me. Why? Because that was God's intent for Christmas. Now what are you going to do with that intent? He came to bring salvation, to bring peace, to bring a personal relationship with God the Father. But you can only have it as you receive it. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God to them that believe on his name. Will you believe it? Will you accept it? Will you let God's intent be carried out in your life? I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes just for a few seconds. In just a few minutes, Doc's going to lead in a song of invitation. Some of you here have never received God's intent for your life. You've never been saved. And you need to be saved today. That's why Jesus came to this earth. That's why Christmas is all about. Is God expressing His divine love and His willingness to forgive whosoever will. And I'll not quote John 3.16 again, but you know it. And God wants that for your life. But you have to be willing to receive it. Christian, what is God speaking to you about today? What intent in Christmas has He given to you? To bring peace to others? To have goodwill towards others? To bring them that something that they could never buy because they couldn't afford it? And that's the person of Jesus Christ. I want to ask you today, Christian, do you have that peace in your heart that you've told others? about the wonderful grace of God, the miracle that He could perform in their lives? What is needed in your life today? Have you lost that true first Christmas? What is the first Christmas? It's a child that was born, but not just any ordinary child. A child that came to fulfill the intent of the Heavenly Father so you and I could have life. Now listen that we can have it more abundantly. What are you going to do with it? Let's stand with heads bowed and eyes closed. Father in heaven, 
I want to ask you to take your word this morning. Though we've been short, I pray you take the songs that were sung and the messages thereof and bring them home to our hearts. And let us see the realness in an outward way of why you left heaven's portals of glory to come here to empathize and sympathize with us in our condition so you could do something about it. We thank you for your love. We thank you that you care. And I pray that every person here this morning will be ready to receive that which you speak to their hearts about. May they not sit back in their seats, but may they respond to this invitation when we have it this morning. And we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name, with heads bowed and eyes closed. What is God speaking to your heart about right now? Would you respond? Will you come? I'm going to be standing down here at the front. Brother Ed, I'd like for you to come and stand over on this side. And if you'd like to have someone talk with you and help you to come to know Christ this morning, or if you want someone to pray with you, we'll have a counselor to talk with you. But whatever your need is today, don't neglect God's intent for your life. Would you come right now as Doc begins to sing? <laughs>